Good evening, Highland Baptist Church. Thank you so much for joining us online for our last online only Bible study. Next week, we are going to be starting our in-person Wednesday night uh, program with the electives, and that's going to be Colossians, Ecclesiastes, and we're going to look at the book of Daniel. And we're just super excited about this option for uh, starting our in-person Wednesday nights, and uh, it's going to be a fantastic time, taught by three great people and you'll glean so much from that. You'll get to pick one of those classes and attend one of those. We're going to have everyone spread out, so you'll be social distanced as well, but uh, just going to be a good time together on Wednesday nights, kind of in a different little format than uh, we had been doing before we had to go online only. So we're looking forward to that and hope that you will join us on our Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock in person. Let's go ahead and take out our prayer list now, and we'll go over that together. First, we're just praising the Lord that we had three people baptized on Sunday and follow the Lord, uh, an example there for us to uh, be baptized. And we're so excited that they took that next step in their faith. And then we're also praying for those that uh, need salvation. So there's several there that are listed on our prayer list, so we'll be praying for them specifically. A couple of things that we want to make mention of tonight is David Roke. He's having some uh, pain from a heartburn reflux. Uh, Pastor Abel said this morning during the online prayer that uh, he's just not want to eat even at this point. So be praying for David Roke, uh, if you would, on that. And then Ken and Kathy Woods are having some health problems, so be praying for them. They're a newer family to our church. Um, great, great couple, but be praying for them. Be praying for Ann Wisner. She tested positive for COVID uh, and having a, some sore throat issues, uh, so be praying for her. And then Chris and Marlene Austin, uh, daughter Amanda. So Amanda Austin is recovering from surgery that she had. Uh, it was kind of an emergency surgery. So we're praying for her. Uh, she comes on our Wednesday night. She's a young adult that comes on, uh, excuse me, Sunday nights uh, usually. And so just be praying for her uh, and, and her recovery. Kermit Claver, praying for his next surgery and he's recovering from. We prayed for that. I believe that was last week that he was on the prayer list that we were praying for, for that. But he had a surgery, so be praying for that. And then the Mingle household, not feeling well. Uh, it's got some sore throats, I think, is what they said. And kids uh, just not feeling well. So just be praying for that family, if you would. And then continue prayer for Chris and Angie Rarden's son, Brayton. Um, he had a skin grafting done yesterday. Everything went well. Um, and he's actually improving quite well to... Uh, the doctor surprise, so that is that is good, and um, no surprise to us because <laughs> we know the ultimate physician, right? So, uh, but continue praying for him if you would. And then Cheryl Graddock's granddaughter Haley had surgery today, and Cheryl, if you're on this evening, will you please give us an update on uh, your granddaughter Haley? And then if you would, pray for Misty Cloud or Misty Marnod, same person. Uh, she, she was married there, but grant, her grandfather passed away. So let's pray for comfort for the family, if you would, during this time um, as she's lost her grandfather. So, And then Jennifer Hill's mother, Mary, uh, who's been taking cancer treatment, was put back in the hospital, I believe it was, the other day and uh, had a high temperature. So... Be praying for um, her mother, Mary, who's been battling um, this cancer. And then at Walter Tibbetts, we prayed for last week. Uh, where he's home recovering. His surgery was successful. So we praise the Lord for that. And um, we just thank him for his goodness to us and to the Salter or to the uh, Tibbet family. And then if you would be praying for Project 99. Uh, they're a missionary group um, in a restricted access uh, nation, and so we're praying for them. 
if you would. Lord's doing some uh, pretty interesting things over there in that country, but uh, be praying for their safety. Let's go ahead and take these things to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we just want to thank you so very, very much for the fact that you uh, heal God. I think of Brayton and Lord, I think of all those that have had successful surgeries and uh, Lord, we mentioned a few of those tonight. God, I just pray that you will just continue to heal them. Lord, we thank you that um, we're still seeing folks uh, added to our church and uh, in membership and Lord, also for folks growing in their faith, like baptism, God, and I just thank you for that, Lord. Uh, I pray that um, you will just uh, encourage folks to take those next steps in their faith and to grow in their faith, Lord. And Lord, I just lift up David Roki, who's having some uh, pain, Lord. I pray that you'll just uh, be with him. Lord, I pray that you'll be with Kent and Kathy, who's having some health problems. Lord, you know what those are. And Lord, I just pray that you'll just heal them. God, I pray that you'll be with Ann Wisner. She tested positive for COVID, God. I pray that you'll just heal her throat, Lord, specifically. Lord, and then she'll cure her from this and allow Robert not to, to get COVID. God, I pray that you'll be with uh, Amanda Austin, Lord. I pray that you'll just uh, heal her body, Lord, and uh, thank you for, um, for them being part of our church. And Lord, I just pray for healing for, for Amanda. God, I pray that you'll be with Kermit Clavers, recovering from the neck surgery. I pray that you'll just be with him, Lord. I pray that you'll be with the Mingles not feeling well. Lord, I pray that you'll continue being with Brayton. Lord, that you will uh, just continue to heal his body. We thank you for the great progress that he's made thus far. And Lord, I just pray that you will be with him. God, I want to lift up uh, Haley had surgery today. Lord, I pray that things went well there, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you'll just, uh, just continue to heal her, give her a good recovery. Lord, I pray that you'll be with uh, Misty, uh, the family there, Lord, as loss of her grandfather. Lord, I pray that you'll just be with them, comfort her, come alongside her, and love on her, God, and let her know that she is loved. God, I pray that you'll be with Jennifer Hill's mother, Lord. We've been praying for her, and Lord, I pray that you'll just continue to uh, be with her, and, and your will be done in that situation. Lord, I pray that you'll be with the Tibbets, Lord, and, and I thank you that his surgery was successful. I pray that you'll just continue to heal them. God, I just lift up uh, Project 99 to you specifically, and I thank you for all that um, you're doing in their ministry, Lord, and, and the country of Lebanon. Lord, I just pray that you just watch uh, over the missionaries there, protect them, keep them safe, Lord, and allow them to spread the gospel, Lord, in this uh, very interesting country, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you will just uh, shine your light brightly there through them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, guys, here's a quick video, and then we'll get into tonight's lesson on Jesus is in control. Take a look at the video.
Well, before we start, we are going to end this series today, and it will end with the arrest of Jesus. There have been so many interesting things that we have learned about Jesus, his ministry while he was here on earth. I want to ask you, which of the encounters have you been most impressed with during our series? Let me know in the comment section. And while you're thinking, I just want to recall some of those lessons that we have seen. We have seen where Jesus interacted with John, the encounters with the high priest, Jesus declaring he is the line of the world. We have seen that Jesus is completely worth following and that he's worthy to be worshipped. He's superior to all things and so much more. But what has had the greatest impact on your life or impressed you the most during this series? This evening, I want to look at the process of the arrest and the pre-trial of Jesus before the crucifixion. Let's read John 18, 1 to 27. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops, and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, Whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, that the sayings might be fulfilled, which he spoke of those whom you gave me. I have lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Then the detachment of troops and the captain and officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Now the disciple was known to the high priest and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door outside. Then the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. Then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and the officers who had made a fire of coal stood there, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself the high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple, where the Jews always met me, and in secret I had said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who you heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Do you answer the high priest like that? And Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, then why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. Therefore they said to him, are you not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him, whom his ear Peter cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? 
Peter then denied again, and immediately a rooster crowed. Okay, so Jesus had just finished up his time with the disciples in the upper room. The time period was during the Passover. And again, they were sacrificing lambs around the temple. And do you remember where the temple is at during this time period? It was in Jerusalem. Now, if you'll remember, back a few weeks ago, where did Jesus decide not to go since they were plotting to kill him? Jerusalem. Exactly. Now we find Jesus in the upper room in Jerusalem. He and his disciples are now leaving to go to the southeast corner of Jerusalem, where the garden is believed to be located. Now, on the way to the garden, what do they pass by? Well, in verse 1, we find that it is in the brook of Kidron. Now, why do you think John would have mentioned this specifically? Well, the blood from the lambs being sacrificed would funnel from the temple and go into the Kidron Valley where the brook was. One more symbol Jesus is subtly using to remind the disciples that he was the lamb that was going to take away the sins of the world. From verse 2, we can note there's something else here. Jesus would often meet with his disciples at this location. The other Gospels give us more details, and John specifically says here that Judas knew the place. So that indicates to me that there was a secret fishing spot, if you will. This was a special spot reserved for Jesus during special moments. Then in verse 3 and 4, we see something very interesting. Judas is bringing about 2,000 men with him with weapons and torches. And when they come to the place, it's Jesus that's stepping up to them. Now, here's what is ironic about this whole thing. What does the first part of verse 4 say? Jesus, knowing all things, he asks, who are you seeking? The next part of the verse, they say the most humiliating thing they could to Jesus. They call him Jesus of Nazareth. Now, remember from previous study, they tease Jesus, and this is a humiliating comment because they're like, what good thing can come from Nazareth? Now, I don't know about you, but when someone mocks me, what's usually our response? Usually it's this is where we'd start to feel the temperature rising in our minds and our hearts. This is where we would have some very clever response back to him or her. But this is not the response that Jesus has. Jesus simply keeps his cool. And he says, I am he. But something miraculous happens. They all fall to the ground. See, when we really understand the glory of the Lord, what should be our response? The same thing happened to the prophets Ezekiel and John. And John describes his experience in Revelation 22. It says, that was told to him by the angel of the Lord. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Jesus speaking says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship. One other thing I want us to notice is that you probably have already noticed this, but Jesus goes peacefully. Now, what was the reason that Jesus wasn't already caught? Yes, his hour had not come. Jesus knew that this was the hour. Then we see Peter cutting off the ear of one of the high priest's servants. Now, I don't think this was done by accident. Peter knew how to send a message. Like, don't mess with us, man. But what happens next? Jesus rebukes him, and then he literally fixes Peter's mess. What a powerful thought. We may have the right intentions, and maybe even our actions in our own perspective, but Jesus' plan will still be accomplished, regardless of what we do or we say. See, the action didn't change the course of how the arrest would go. Jesus could have ran, but rather he knew he must stay. The rest of the passage deals with Jesus on trial, and during that time, we see what's going on with Peter. So what is the common theme throughout all of this? 
what connects all of these different parts that we have had happen in order to fill the words of Christ that Jesus, he's in control. What is he in control over? Well, one, Jesus is in control over everyone. All the key players in this passage are right here in the midst of Jesus. Jesus is not once surprised by any of the events that are unfolding. Jesus doesn't have a plan B because plan A is already happening. The second thing I want us to understand is that Jesus is in control of everything. See, we could look at this passage a little differently and say, well, it was just a series of chance that all of this stuff played out. Jesus is working sovereignly in our lives, controlling things in my life and your life for his good and glory. I heard this phrase, and I think it's so true. When it seems that things are falling apart, God has things falling into place. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. I am sure that there are times in your life where you thought God was not in control, but realized later that he was. So what can we remind ourselves about the fact that God is in complete control of the universe? First, it can remove the anxiety and worry from our lives. We can trust that what the Bible claims about God's character because it's backed up by his ability. Not only does God love us, but he has the ability to care for us. Those who are part of the family of God can claim the promise in Romans 8.28, which says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Over the course of this series, we have looked at many different attributes of Christ. These attributes can bring us great comfort and joy. Christ being in control of all the events and people coming and going from our lives. Worry is a subtle way of telling God that he's fallen asleep at the wheel and that things aren't under his authority but ours. Yet we can make an active choice to say no to worry. Instead of spinning on the thoughts of everything that feels so out of control, we can choose to turn to God. We can ground ourselves in the truth that he is sovereign, that he is the ultimate superpower who holds all things together. Nothing escapes his notice. We can rest assured that he is far more concerned with our well-being than we are, and he loves us more than we can possibly fathom. Secondly, trust that his control allows for my spiritual growth. Many times, Christians feel that maturing in the faith is completely up to them, as if God saves us and then expects us to do the rest. We do play a role in our spiritual growth, because we're called to obedience, and what we do has a significant impact on our maturity. However, we must also recognize that God is sovereign and in control of our lives, we have to trust that God is going to bring us to a place of growth. I can remember the time that I was in sixth grade and my mom was in the hospital. I can remember it like it was yesterday. We had just gotten back from South Carolina visiting some of my grandparents, and it was over the 4th of July holiday. Just a few days after the celebration, my mom went into the hospital, and we went to my grandparents' house. And after extended stay there, then back to my aunts and back to another set of grandparents and then back and forth. And I, I began wondering what was going on. I can remember sitting outside with my grandma, who I called Granny. I can remember telling her about what was going on in, in, in my life. And then she explained to me what was going on in my mom's. At that point, I hadn't seen my mom or dad for about a month or so. And it was getting close to the start of a new school year. I can remember that she told me that my mom was in ICU and other things were not looking good. I can remember in that moment feeling like everything was completely out of control. I can remember looking to the sky and thinking, why is this happening to me? And I said earlier that there are times in our lives that we feel 
like God is out of control. But we have to remember that God is in complete control and using it to help us grow in our relationship with him. And boy, did that experience ever. As I look back on that part of my life, I can see that it was one of the most pivotal moments for my spiritual life. It exposed this area in my life that I needed to trust him more in. These moments in our lives should bring more glory to God and growth to us spiritually. When you find yourself in these moments of feeling like life is spinning out of control, remember the Lord is using them to draw you closer to himself and ask yourself, what is the Lord trying to teach me through this? Now, I know it can be tough, especially when you have all the details of the situation right out in front of you and you're looking at it and feeling overwhelmed. But remembering that the Lord is in control can bring peace and comfort along with spiritual growth. A friend of mine who just lost a niece to someone hitting her while she was crossing the street, and this niece was only 13 years old, it put it, he put it this way, instead of asking God why, he is asking God, what's next? I thought that was a great way to look at it and to help bring comfort to this tragic, tough moment in his life. Thirdly, because God is in control, it brings security. I think we can all quickly understand this because this is something that we often experience in our lives, but probably rarely acknowledge it specifically. Think about it this way. When you go to an event of some kind, let's say it's a sporting event, there is a process that you have to follow, right? You have to buy the tickets, which you have a very specific seat that you were assigned. The gates open at a very specific certain amount of time to allow you to find your seat. And then after a set amount of time, the event starts. These are all scheduled purposely to bring you a sense of security and allow you to know that they have it planned out. And this is not a free-for-all event that you're just going to have the good luck, find your seat kind of thing. They even have an event staff on standby to take care of a situation that might arise to break that flow of events, which are to help provide a sense of control. Here's another way to think about it. When a child lives with you or stays with you, they are trusting that you have everything under control while they are in your care. They have a security that if something arises, you are going to be the one to handle it because you love them. When we understand how powerful God is and how much he loves us, we can know that we are secure in him. As the objects of God's love, we can allow God to define us and give us our worth rather than look to the changing ideal of the world to do so. When we understand that God is in complete control, we are freed to live our lives. We can be confident that God will have his way and that it will be good and we can trust the one who says he loves us and he is fully able to act on that love in all ways. We can trust that even when the world seems completely out of control, God is in control. We know that he has the big picture covered so we can trust him with all our daily details. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for all the things that you do for us, God, because it's in your sovereign plan for our lives. God, the people that come in and out of our lives, the people that we influence, Lord, all of that is purposely in our lives because you have a reason. God, help us to remember. Help us to have the sense of security. Help us not to worry. Lord, and remember that you are the one that are, is in control. Thank you for all the attributes that we were able to look at, and we are just simply excited about them. Lord, and I just pray that we'll be reminded of them daily, and we'll remember to trust you the way that we ought to trust you. Lord, we love you so very much. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, guys, I hope that you have enjoyed this series. I am so looking forward to the in-person Wednesday night electives. This Wednesday night, don't forget, we will be having um, a meal together to fellowship and you can spend some extra time there. It'll be pizza, so come at 6.30 if you'd like that. 
Otherwise, service will start at seven and you'll have three different options to choose from. And I hope to see you there and you have a fantastic rest of your week. God bless.